Welcome to Utah State University's Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany class. This is lecture 22 where we ask the question and try to answer it. What are trilobites and other fossil arthropods? Now arthropods, which include um, insects, spiders, crustaceans, and trilobites, are the most diverse of all groups of plants and animals. And with such incredible diversity, I don't think I can do the group justice in a single 30-minute lecture. So instead, what I thought I would do is to focus on some of the iconic fossil arthropods in the fossil record, and principally focus on the famous trilobites. Now trilobites, despite being extinct for over 250 million years, are still fairly well recognized even by novice paleontologists. There are exclusively marine organisms being found in many marine shales from the Paleozoic era, and they're placed within the larger group, the arthropods, based on a number of shared derived features. These include a segmented body. This is a character shared with annelid worms and appears to be a protosomal character, a very early primitive character for this group of protosomes. They all have paired limbs or, and or gills to each body segment. Um, this is the first group that we've looked at that has these paired appendages. Uh, most of the groups are mobile, although some, like barnacles, become sessile. They have an exoskeleton that's shed. This is made of cuticle chitin, or um, it, many times it'll be formed out of calcium carbonate. That's what uh, trilobites do. So they have an external skeleton. Now they must molt their exoskeleton to grow. This means that many groups undergo morphological change with each shed of the exoskeleton. And many groups actually un undergo like really radical metamorphism, such as caterpillars to butterflies. And fifth, the final um, character of arthropods is that they have sense organs. They have things like eyes and they even have a small brain and nerve fibers that run through a, a central nervous system. So this is the first real group that we have that has a pretty complicated, actually very complicated sense organs. So all of these characters are found within all arthropods. All right, so let's take a look at modern living members of arthropods and see how they've been classified in order to see uh, where we can try to fit in the extinct trilobites. Now, modern um, arthropods are broken down into a number of nested groups, each of which are extremely diverse and abundant today. Um, most of these groups are actually terrestrial, though many of them are marine as well. The first group is the most diverse, the hexapodia. These are animals that have six legs. They include uh, true insects and flies. Um, it includes moths and butterflies. It's just a huge, very diverse group, including ants as well. Members of this group are extremely diverse, but they all have the same sort of basic body plan. They have an anterior head, a thorax, and a posterior abdomen with three paired legs. So trilobites with their many legs and segments are not a member of this group. Now the fossil record of the hexapoda extend all the way back to the Devonian period with the fossil Strutidinelli devoniaca, which appears to have had three paired legs in a segmented body with a, a head, thorax, and a larger abdomen. Now these early Devonian insects are close to appearance to modern springtails, which belong to a group called the endognathia. Now the endognathia basically means that the mouth parts are actually retracted inside the head. Now this group are, include mostly wingless insects. In fact, they're all wingless, um, such as springtails and other bugs that you find feeding on decaying matter on land. The other major group of the hexapodia, the other major group of the hexapodia are the ectognathids. These mean that the mouth parts are actually outside of the head. And they also have a fossil record that extends all the way back to the Devonian. Now, this group includes many winged insects, and this seems to be some evidence that the origin of flight in insects originated sometime during the Devonian, or maybe even earlier, just as our ancestors were starting to learn how to crawl out onto land. So insects had us beat by a long shot in terms of colonizing land and developing the ability to fly going all the way back to the Devonian. Now the hexapodia are often regarded as a sister group to another major terrestrial group, the myopodia. 
Now, the myrapodia include um, uh, centipedes, they include millipedes, and as you can guess from their names, they have many, many legs rather than being restricted to just six legs. Now, the myrapodia have been removed as a sister group, the hexapodia, based on molecular phylogenies that place the crustacea as more closely related to the hexapodia. Now, this phylogeny indicates that the hexapodia and the myopodia independently came out of the water during the Paleozoic to diversify on land. And so you have two groups so far that we've discussed that actually come out of the waters and become specialized to living on land. The fossil record of the Myopodia goes all the way back to the Silurian, indicating that the Myopodia have been probably one of the first groups of animals and plants to become land living, and the first animal to develop a respiration system to breathe oxygen from the air. Now, between the Myopodia and the Hexapodia is a really diverse group of aquatic organisms, the Crustacea. So these include things like the uh, Branchiopoda, these are the brine shrimp, they include a really weird group, the Remnopedia. These are blind crustaceans that look kind of like centipedes that live um, under uh, water. Um, many of them are blind and live in caves. Um, they, in some molecular phylogenies, they fall out as a sister group to the Hexapodia, which is interesting. There is also the Cephalocardae. These are the horseshoe shrimp, but you probably know these as triops. These are the famous uh, group of little shrimpers that people take home as pets from, you know, hobby stores and stuff. And they take their eggs and they hydrate them and they hatch and you get these little triops. Now, these are an interesting group because they have a very extensive fossil record going all the way back to the Carboniferous. So they're an example of a living fossil. The next group are the Maxiopoda. These include the barnacles and fish lice and some other things. Barnacles are just bizarre creatures. They are an arthropod that decided to become sessile. So these are related to shrimp. They develop an exoskeleton that they can continually grow and live within a sessile sort of form living burrowed against um, organisms. So here's some on some bivalves. You see them on ships and stuff. And they basically will throw out their feeding legs. These are actually their legs that they throw out and bring in food into their mouth. And they're just really bizarre and unusual creatures. So I just want to show you a quick video here of some barnacles. You can see they're throwing their little legs out. Um, and these guys are actually mating. So that long strand is a penis that is extending out of the barnacles and going in and prodding various other members of the colony for sexual reproduction to deliver the sperm to each one of those individuals. This video here shows some barnacles that are actually feeding and you can see how they're using their feet to sweep the water and catch food and bring it down into their little shelled structures there. So they send out their feet like this and their little mouth is grabbing hold of things as they're feeding. So this is an example of a arthropod that has become a sessile organism. Now the next group that we have um, in here are the ostracata. These are um, sometimes referred to as seed shrimp. Now the ostracata have an actually fabulous fossil record um, and they make it into freshwater systems. And the ostracata um, are basically have shell, they're shelled um, shrimp basically is what they are. They have like a hard um, calcium carbonate shell that they produce on either side of them to help protect them. And they swim around um, oftentimes in huge numbers, vast numbers. Uh, feeding on various detritus in the, in the water. And then the last group is the group you're probably most familiar with. These are the Malacostria. These include the lobsters. They also include the crabs. A lot of shrimp are in this group as well. So those are the crustacea. And those are now kind of regarded as the sister group of the hexapodia, which is kind of interesting. Now together, the hexapodia, the crustacean, and the myopodia form a clade, and this is called a mandibulata. Now, mandibulata is a very large group of the arthropods. So this includes all the millipedes and centipedes and all the crustaceans, the shrimp, the lobsters, the barnacles, the little lice shrimp, and includes all the insects as well. So a pretty diverse group. So one of the questions we have with trilobites is, 
are they members of the Maliapoda? And so this is one of the interesting questions we can ask. So now that Maliapoda are held together by the fact that they actually have a mandible. So they p possess a paired mandible apparatus. And now this apparatus is different than what we'll see in other groups because it's used in food gathering and in, in, in chewing. So it's actually used to grab hold of food and bring it in and actually masticate or break up the food uh, into their mouths. So these groups are all united in having a mandible um, sort of apparatus. So if we look at specimens of trilobites that actually preserve the ventral parts of the surface of these guys, um, the mouth actually lacks any paired mandibular uh, apparatuses. And so it has a more primitive configuration. Hence, most workers place the trilobites between some of the more primitive members of the arthropod groups. So let's take a look at what some of these strange creatures that are more primitive within the arthropod giant, huge, bushy tree. The first group is the Cherocetria. These include a very diverse group of arthropods that many authors suggest form a monophyletic group. They're united in actually possessing a surret area, a paired appendage that can carry food into the mouth. So it's kind of like some claws actually have pinchers that can grab hold of food and put it in the mouth, but it's not used in chewing or, or any sort of mastication. Not all groups have a cherata, and some crustaceans utilize claws in a similar manner, so you gotta be careful. Now, another defining feature of the Chera serrata is the fact that none of its members exhibit antenna, which is kind of peculiar. Now, the Chera serrata include the Meristoma, which includes the modern-day horseshoe crabs, Litimus. Now, fossils that closely resemble um, Litimus extend into the fossil record going all the way back to the Mesozoic. The genus Mesolimus uh, from the Jurassic of Germany actually closely resembles, almost looks exactly like a modern day uh, horseshoe crab. And this makes the genus Limitus a really good example of a living fossil, where for very long periods of geological time, the morphology of a species does not change significantly. Now the Meristoma has a fossil record that extends all the way back to the Cambrian. And unlike crabs and lobsters, members of the Meristoma don't have those mandibular appendages or teeth like um, jaws beside the, the mouth. Instead, they have a set of pincer-like uh, appendages at the front of the mouth for grabbing food, but they're not necessarily used for chewing. Now, closely related to the horseshoe crabs, oftentimes placed within the same class, is the sea scorpions, the Uriopterids. Now, the Uriopids uh, lived from the Ordovician to the Permian, having fallen victim to the Permian-Triassic extinction, just about it, like everything else. Most members of the Uriopsids are rather small, but some forms got to be really big, about two meters in length or so. They likely lived on the ocean floor, scuttling around, and tra there's been trace fossils that have been found that indicate that they could crawl along the surface, and some people have even proposed that they were actually able to come out of the water for short periods of time. Um, they're most diverse during the Silurian, and with the first occurrence of their record in the fossil record during the Ordovician. All right, the next group of the Cheria serrata are the very diverse class, the Arachnids which includes spiders and scorpions. And this is another group of arthropods that become specialized for life on land. Now this group has a fossil record that extends all the way back to the Silurian. In fact, the arachnids are likely the first group of arthropods to diversify for life on land and probably co-occurred with those early land myopodia. Now, the group has a really good fossil record, despite the fact that their exoskeleton is actually made out of chitin, and so they don't preserve as well. The last group of the Chericeratin are the sea spiders. This is one of my favorite groups. These are a fully marine group of arthropods living on the ocean floor. Um, they have a great fossil record going all the way back to the Cambrian. So very bizarre group. Um, 
and just very weird. All right, there are two other groups that are found often placed as an outgroup to the arthropods, and neither of which have a very extensive fossil record. They have kind of a problematic fossil record for that. The first group is the velvet worms. These are the onclophoria, which mean uh, the claw bearers. They're often to be related to the very strange and bizarre halogentia um, from the Burgess Shale of Canada. These are weird fossils that people have puzzled over um, what they actually are, um, but most people place them within the velvet room worm group, the Onchiophoria. They have segmented, they have um, spines or limbs that project out of the skeleton. They don't really have a, an exoskeleton, they don't have a, uh, a skeleton like um, other arthropods, so they're often placed outside of the arthropods. The next group that's often entered into discussions of arthropods are the uh, Tologoids, or the water bears. These are really teeny tiny like worms. They're segmented bodies, um, super tiny, um, very, very um, microscopic little organisms. Um, recent studies have suggested that the tardigrades are maybe possibly more closely related to nematode worms, and that's based on some of the molecular data that's coming out. But some studies have suggested a possible relation to arthropods, including some of the things like dust mites and some of these really teeny arthropods. Um, we'll have to see in terms of the phylogeny. These guys have no fossil record at all because they're just so tiny. All right, so here is the list of the massive nomenclature of various arthropod groups, and this is based on what is presented at, in the textbook um, of these various subphyla that are recognized. So the systematic position of trilobites is kind of debated as they appear to be closely related to both the Meristomia and the Myopoda. Um, so we don't quite know exactly where they, where they fit in. Um, now there is one fossil that seems to offer some characters that are shared with the Meristomia, the Myromodia, and the Trilobites. And that fossil is from the early Cambrian, and it's called Marinella. And it's actually placed within its own class. Marinia was discovered by Charles Wolcott at the um, Burgess Shale Fossil Site in British Columbia, Canada. It possesses a head shield with two large spines, and then anterior to the head shield is another pair of spines which project out to the side. And anterior to that is another um, set that extends the length of, of the body. And these, um, there are many body segments in which the appendages are feathery filaments or probably gills that were used during respiration. Now, Marinella has a pair of rearward spines, spikes, and a pair of antenna connected to the head shield, which means it's not necessarily regarded as a member of the Cerata because those guys don't have antenna. Now, however, trilobites also have antenna, so Marinera makes a good ancestral form for trilobites. Now, each appendage has two branches. So the top branch is the gill that's used for respiration, and the bottom branch is a leg. This is very similar to what we see in trilobites. As such, Marinera is often invoked as sort of the stem trilobite. All right, so trilobites are positioned within arthropods, possibly along with the Sheratrata clade or the Myopoda clade, and since they both appear so early in the fossil record, they're often viewed as an early arthropod offshoot that becomes very successful during the Paleozoic. In fact, there's about 5,000 genera of trilobites known, so they're very, very diverse. All right, so let's look at some of the anatomical features of trilobites and define some useful terms. Now, the trilobite body is divided into three major sections. It's got the cephalon up here, it's the head, the thorax, this middle part, and then it's got the petygium, which is the bottom part, the butt of the trilobite. Trilobites are also known for having these three longitudinal lobes, right? So it's got a right and left pleural lobe, and then it's got what's called the axial lobe, which is this part here shaded in blue. Now the cephalon, or head, contains the gabiella. Uh, this is a raised protuberance on the center of the cephalon with often paired eyes on either side. On the ventral side, if you turn it over, 
of, on the bottom of the trilobite is a hypostone, a small plate that's held the mouth and the entrance to the gut tube. Now there's all a whole bunch of different ways in which paleontologists can describe the anatomy of trilobites in many different conditions. One of the important conditions is the celiac sutures that split the cephalon. And they're used by paleontologists as an important character and for diagnosing or identifying various members of trilobites. All right, so let's take a look at this trilobite right here. Um, let's see if we can pair it with the type of celiac sutures that it has. So we have the proparian um, condition where the side of the lateral margin is not involved in the spine. And then the next one we have is the uh, goniotoporian. Um, in this case, the lateral margin here is actually involved in the spine here. And then finally, we have the ospiaparian condition. In this condition, the lateral margin here of the cephalon is actually composes the complete spine of the cephalon. So take a look at this fossil. Let's see which one it uh, is a member of. So we can see there's the suture coming down through here. It comes down, comes down over here. Oh, you know what? Looks like it's the last one. Hopefully you agree, so it's the last one there. All right, so let's look at another character, and this is the placement of the hypostone on the ventral surface. So this is on the bottom surface of a trilobite. Um, we got the natalent um, condition. This is where the, the hypostome it does not contact the margin of the, of the uh, cephalon there. We have the counter condition in which it does contact the lateral margin. And then we got the impedient in which the lateral margin is outgrown. It contacts it, but it is greatly expanded. All right, so let's take a look at this fossil, this fossil trilobite, and try to determine which one of these three conditions it has. All right, yes, it is the middle condition here. So it's a countermet. You can see that the hypostome extends all the way to the margin there, and the margin is pretty, is not, not really thickened. Now the anatomy of trilobites is a little bizarre. So that bumpy thing on the front of the head is not the nose, but it's the stomach, and that's called the gababellia. And it actually holds an expansion of the gut tube, so it holds a stomach. Um, and then it has the mouth opening on the ventral side of the, uh, the trilobite. Now the other weird thing about the anatomy of trilobites is that each of the limbs are actually paired with a gill so that as it moves along the ocean floor, the gills would get a fresh supply of oxygenated waters from the movement of those limbs. Um, this is similar to what many arthropods do, and in land, many arthropods develop book lungs that are underneath their porous exoskeletons. Now, the exoskeleton of trilobites is made out of low magnesium calcite, which is a hard material that can be used for protection, and trilobites can coil up into balls for defense. In fact, many fossils have been found with trilobites actually in these coiled defensive positions. Now, because the ex exoskeleton of trilobites is made of calcite, it actually readily preserves in the fossil record as well. Now, the exoskeleton or cuticle of the trilobites is composed of two layers, a relatively thin outer layer with very large calcite crystals and a much thicker inner layer of tiny calcite crystals. Now this inner layer is formed in small lamellar sheets, which provide some flexibility. There are oftentimes little pores or canals that run through the exoskeleton, and these likely serve for small hairs or setia for sensing the environment outside of the exoskeleton. Perhaps the most remarkable adaptation of trilobites is the development of eyes. It is the most ancient of the visual systems known. Now, trilobites have compound eyes like modern crustaceans and insects. However, since their exoskeleton is composed of calcite, which has a high diffraction of light, the lenses, the crystal lenses um, that compose the eye, need to be arranged just right to prevent any sort of distortion of the images. Now, most trilobites um, have eyes that are what we call the holochorial condition. And this is where the lenses in each um, eye are actually in contact with each other, and then the entire lens is covered by a coronal membrane. A more complex eye is found in the Fichiopian trilobites, 
and this is called the scler sclerochorial eyes. Now these trilobites differ in having an interstellar material called sclera between the lenses. And the lenses are really broad, really big. And the light in these trilobites is more complexly, complexly focused, and it provided probably visual senses even during periods of molting when other trilobites would be blind during the process of shedding. The last type of eye of trilobites are the abathochorial eyes. Um, they're found in the order Agnothista, which includes many um, blind trilobites. And as such, it probably represents a reduced or vestigial sclerochorial condition that we see. And so they're kind of on the way of actually losing their eyes and becoming blind, which is kind of interesting. There is a huge variety of trilobite eyes represented in the fossil record. Some had giant eyes and likely used those that were nectonic or swimming along. Others had very broad eyes, great for low light conditions on the bottoms of the ocean. Others had eyes on long stalks, so they may raise those eyes above muddy, uh, muddy substrate. And, and then there's many examples of trilobites that actually go blind, that lose their, their eyes and don't rely on them, and swim around um, completely blind like these little blind agnosid uh, trilobites. All right, I thought I would go through um, and discuss the various groups of trilobites, the various orders of trilobites, and give you some uh, pictures of some of the diversity of these various groups. So trilobites originate during the early Cambrian, uh, probably from something like Mariaelia. Uh, and the first group that we get to is the Redlinkia. The next group is the Anthnozoidae. These include many of the blind trilobites, and they're kind of peculiar in the fact that they have the sort of double feature. These were believed to be swimmers, swimming around in the water and using the two ends, the very enlarged petechium, to swim around um, and gather food in very low light conditions. The next group is the Aspiphoridae. These include groups that go from the middle Cam Cambrian up to the late Silurian. Um, they uh, include the members that have the long stalked eyes. The Picroparidae, this is the next group. These are known also from the middle Cambrian into the Ordovician. They include these groups that have a very enlarged cephala and sort of short little uh, bodies or plural lobes. Another group that has very large cephala are the harpopedid. These guys have these very ring-like huge giant um, cephalons that extend with these very long uh, spines that extend almost to the entire length of their bodies, which is pretty, pretty impressive. The next group is the longest lived group. This is the only group to have made it through into the Carboniferous and the Permian. So you can see that at the end of the Devonian many of these groups uh, start to go out, um, start to disappear. And this includes the very common uh, Philipsia. Probably the most famous and more common of the trilobites is Phacops, uh, the Phacopidae. These are the ones with the very complex eyes. Um, very common. These guys can actually get pretty big too. I've seen some large ones um, in collections. And they're known from the Ordovician to the Devonian. We then have the Lacadeids. These go back into the late Cambrian. Um, they're characterized by having sort of, um, I don't know, like a broomstick sort of um, legs, uh, segments that come out and sort of sweep out, um, which are very unique. The Odonta Pluridae. This is a group that includes the very spiny trilobites. These are often very popular with collectors because they have these very long, delicate spines that often preserve in the fossil record. And then we have the Chloronexachia. These are a group of trilobites. Um, some of them have spines, but many of them forego those later on. Um, and they extend all the way up into the Devonian. All right, so you might be wondering, like, where to go to find some trilobites? So I was going to talk a little bit about Utah's record of trilobites very briefly. So Utah has a fabulous um, record of trilobites. There's sort of two states that have really good trilobites. That's New York and Utah. Most of New York's uh, trilobites are Devonian, and most of Utah's trilobites are all um, Cambrian. So there's a great record of Cambrian trilobites here in Utah. 
Um, the most common uh, formations in which trilobites are found are the Wheeler, Margem, and Weeks formations. And these are exposed in the House Range, which is in the western part of Utah, out in the Great Basin. Um, there are many sites west of Delta, Utah, where you can go and collect. And there's some um, places where you can pay uh, the landowners to go on to their property and collect in quarries. And they sort of guarantee that you'll find uh, trilobites there. Um, if you're closer around Salt Lake, the Ophra Shale does produce some trilobites. Another place where trilobite bites have been documented is the Langston Formation and the Younger Ute Formation that also has trilobites, as well as the Spence Shale member. Many of these sites are located along the Wellsville Mountains, uh, just sort of north of Brigham City, um, Utah, in western Utah. So many of the sites in western Utah contain trilobites. In eastern Utah, there's fewer trilobites found. Um, that's because most of the Cambrian formations are sandstones and don't pr produce the nice shales that really do a great job of preserving trilobites. One thing just to remind you about trilobites is that they do shed. So many times when you do collect trilobites and are trying to identify them, you need to be aware that there are a ontological series of sheds. Um, and so many times trilobites that look very different might be the same species and you're just seeing younger individuals. So be aware of that whenever you're out collecting and trying to identify trilobites. One last thing before I sign off about trilobites is that they leave behind wonderful traces in the, in the fossil record. And many of these traces um, have been documented throughout the Paleozoic. Um, and this is a trace fossil that's very characteristic. Uh, it's called Cruzana. Now, Cruzana um, is, can be recognized because you see all of those like little individual legs digging around, scuttling around in the sediment. And then oftentimes you'll get a race, uh, rest trace where the little trilobite kind of nestles down into the mud. And then it scuttles up and scuttles along. So you see lots of those little um, uh, legs moving, making lots of little footprints along as they scuttle around. And then oftentimes you'll find like rest places where they stopped and rested before they scuttle on. And oftentimes you find these in many places. And Cruzana is one of those very characteristic trilobate trace fossils. All right, thank you so much for watching another exciting lecture video at Utah State University. If you're interested in taking a class in geology, check out our department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and want to check out my own research, Stop by my website at benjamin slash Thanks again for watching a paleontology lecture.